it's finally time to put that engine back into that chassis. There will be quite a lot of manual handling as I sort of hump it into place. I have the jack ready on the bench for actually jacking it up so there's some control. The bike is on its sort of homemade axle standy things so that I can get the swinging arm pivot out. And I may have to use the services of a friend for some of the lifting, but it's about time to actually get going and make some progress. With the swinging arm pivot just pulled out far enough so we can get the engine into the frame, I hump the engine onto the jack, and with the help of a friend, it's Philip this time, I'm just going to jack the engine up so we can get the first couple of bolts in, then we can give it a bit of a wiggle around to get the rest of the bolts in, and I need to just refer to the workshop manual to make sure I've got the torque settings right for the bolts. Then I'm just going to put a couple of the engine crash bobbins on, and then I can start the exciting things, like the exhaust pipes. Round to the other side of the bike and I start by fitting the chain. It's fairly snug, so I get it over the output shaft first and then fit the front sprocket. Then I can fit the clutch slave cylinder and a few little brackets and bits that sort of hold all the uh, sprocket cover and bits in place. Then I can fit the side stand and then with a little bit of a help from a friend we can lift the bike off its footrest stand and get it back on its normal paddock stand. Next up I fit the radiator. Now the radiator bolts on quite nice and easily, but some of the water pipes are decidedly snug as they run through the middle of the V and behind some of the frame rails. Doesn't really matter where you work on this bike, there's almost guaranteed to be a frame rail in the way. Once the radiator's on and plumbed up, then I move on to refitting footrest and, you know, fairly simple bits like that. Next up I'm going to reconnect all the wiring. There shouldn't be that much wiring because there's only two cylinders, but again, KTM have managed to make it slightly more awkward than I'm sure it needed to be, because the wiring has to either run behind a frame rail or across the top of the engine or somewhere. So I get it all fitted and then start fitting the throttle bodies. And then of course I remember that I fitted some of the wiring wrong and then have to take the throttle bodies back off, refit the wiring where it should run and put the throttle bodies back on. <sighs> I do love motorbikes some of the time. There we have it, a complete looking motorcycle. It hasn't got a fuel tank because I'm going to run it to begin with with no fuel tank just to spin it over and get some oil around it. There are still a few little bits to do. I still actually have to put oil in it. Then I also have to put water in it, which is a little bit of a faff in one of these things. And I still have a sump guard to put on because I'm going to give it a bit of a clean and a repaint before I fit it because... It just doesn't look very good at the moment. So there's a few little odds and sods to do. And I also need to uh, put some fork seals in it because the one on this side is leaking oil. And when I turned the ignition on to see if we had some life, I found the battery is absolutely banjaxed. So it's not quite finished, but at least it's, you know, in less pieces than it was. We're just going to spin it over a little bit and get some oil around it. It's right, the fuel pump failure is correct because, well, the fuel tank's not fed. Well, the oil light went out, so that was a good start. We'll do that again. Right, well, we've definitely got some oil around it. I shall double check the oil level, top it up because you have to fill it in two stages on one of these. And then I'll put a fuel tank on it and see if we can make fire. Now that most of the bike is back together, it's a good opportunity to pull the forks out and put some fork seals in it. And luckily, this bit's actually quite simple. It's a case of just taking the front brake calipers off, taking the front wheel out, getting to the pinch bolts and just sliding the forks straight out. Finally, a job on the KTM that's actually easy to do. These WP forks are an absolute doddle to strip and rebuild. Weirdly, there's no preload adjustment and that only makes them easier. So it's fork cap off, springs and everything out and drain the oil out of them. Pop them in the vise, take the old seal off, put the new seal on with a little bit of plastic to stop it getting damaged. Then you just got to tap the new seal in so it's all the way seated, put the circlips and the dust seals back on and it's time to fill it up with top quality motor oil. A few minutes just to bleed them up and then I double check with the owner because he's actually got the air gap set slightly differently to standard. So I set the air gap to his requirements and before you know it we're putting the top cap and bits back on the forks and they're nearly done. Refitting the forks is just as easy as taking them out. Slide them back into the yokes just making sure they're protruding the right amount through the yokes. Torque the yokes up, 
put the wheel in, put the brake calipers on and the mudguard on, and before you know it, everything's back together. Unfortunately, that does mean it's time to then actually go back and do some more of the dastardly engine work. To bleed the coolant system of air on this KTM, you have to raise the front of the bike half a metre off the floor, and that tilts the cylinders enough that there's a high point, and then you can open a little bleed screw and let the air out of the cylinder heads. It's a bit of a faff. Not only is it somewhat awkward to raise the front of the bike up that far, it's also a bit of a faff because the bleed points are down here, and there's not really a particularly easy way to get to them. What you can see is there's two little screws down there. What doesn't help this job even more is in the workshop manual it points to the top bolt, which would make sense because that's the highest point. But no, that is not the bleed screw for letting the air out of the coolant system. The one behind it is. If you open this one, that lets air into the inlet tract. That did take a little bit of finding. And a touch of swearing. But the bike is now complete with coolant. The system is bled up. <sighs> Nothing's terribly easy with this bike. Right then. Here goes, moment of truth, see if it works. Random warning on the dashboard, but nothing that I think is a problem. I'll just leave that for a minute, let the fluid level settle out. Go around it, check everything, make sure we've not got any leaks, and then uh, I'll run it a bit longer, get some heat into it, and again, go around, just check everything looks all right. So with the bike complete, it's time for a little bit of a recap. In total, we spent just over £1,300 in parts and over 20 hours in labour. So the bill is over £2,000 to fix the gearbox in this KTM. But then I went and rode the bike, and to be honest, it was a right hoot. Round town is a little bit grumbly, but once you get it out on the open road, it is really, really good fun. The engine's actually surprisingly smooth once it's revving, and it really, really only wants to be on one wheel. It is right good fun. But would I buy one? Uh, no. No, I wouldn't. But if you buy one, then I'm sure you'll have a thoroughly good time on it. Just be gentle with the gearbox. Thank you for watching and join me again next time for some more motorbike fun.